Welcome. Today's webinar is Understanding the COVID-19 Temporary Measures Act 2020, a charity's perspective. I am Serene, the moderator for this panel's discussion. Today's webinar is brought to you by the Centre for Non-Profit Leadership, Law Society Pro Bono Services, and the Singapore Corporate Council Association. Please note that any discussion and materials provided in this webinar are not intended to substitute any form of professional legal advice. If you require specific legal advice, please consult a lawyer. With that, I am delighted to introduce our panelists, Mr. Tony So, Adrian Tan, and Renita Cresta. Mr. So is the Deputy CEO of the National Volunteer and Philanthropy Centre. In a career spanning more than 25 years in both public and private sectors, Tony has been involved in work covering, strategy, policy, research, marketing, communications, human resource, business development, and operations. Adrian is a partner at TSMP Law Corporation. He is the Vice President of the Law Society of Singapore and the Honorary Legal Counsel for the Singapore Association of the Visually Handicapped. He was formerly the General Counsel of Crimson Logic. Our next panelist is Renita. She is a group legal counsel for one of Singapore's largest real estate companies, where she advises on a range of matters from litigation and corporate real estate and construction issues to various IP and IT matters. She co-heads the Younger Lawyers Chapter of the Singapore Corporate Council Association. The Singapore Business Times named her one of the top lawyers under 40 in 2017. Mr. So, Adrian and Renita, thank you for joining us today. You. Before we start the webinar, we would like to invite Mr. So to say a few words. Uh, thank you, Serene, um, and good afternoon, friends and partners in the charity sector. Uh, it's a real delight for me to join you this afternoon for this webinar, and it's so heartening for me to see some uh, 300 people who have uh, signed up for this seminar, and uh, I think this is clearly a topic that draws a lot of interest. I think in terms of some context, you know, it's really not an exaggeration to say that this COVID-19 crisis is unprecedented in terms of its speed, its scope, and impact. Uh, some experts have even called it the most serious crisis since the Second World War. And for Singapore, despite four budgets with which subsidies, tax rebates, and rent relief, adding up to almost $100 billion, we are expecting a worst ever recession since independence, with the Singapore economy expected to shrink between 4 and 7% this year. The charity sector has certainly not been spared, and we have actually gone through four and a half months of very challenging situation since DOSCON Orange. Um, the recent announcement of phase two, uh, starting from uh, 19th June, uh, yay, you know, two more days, uh, was met with much relief as the economy begins to reopen. However, as the name Phase 2 uh, Safe Transition implies, we are certainly not out of the woods. Uh, but we can take heart that though we are making progress in our fight against the COVID virus, and this allows us to focus more efforts on tackling the economic challenges that lie ahead. Apart from the budgets to cushion the impact of the crisis on the economy, the government also introduced the COVID-19 Temporary Measures Act 2020 to offer temporary relief to businesses and individuals who, due to the pandemic, are unable to perform their obligations. Uh, in his second reading speech, Minister Shamungam likened this to a legal circuit breaker. A timeout, he says, until this virus dies out and contracts like life can return to normal. The relief generally provide breathing space, a moratorium for businesses and individuals to buy time for landlords and tenants, banks and lenders, and other contracting parties to focus their minds on how to get through the crisis. 
So as the charities will be faced with similar contractual obligations due to COVID-19, the Centre for Nonprofit Leadership, CMPL, of the National Volunteer and Philanthropy Centre, MVPC, approached Law Society Pro Bono Services and the Singapore Corporate Council Association to organise this webinar to help charities better understand the bill and how it affects their business. Uh, this webinar will obviously uh, focus on the bill and the potential impact on charities. And out of the six categories covered by the Act, we will zoom in on three scenarios. Uh, events related contracts, landlord and tenant agreements, and higher purchase agreements. Um, this seminar is one of many initiatives by MVPC and CMPL to reach out and help charities address the challenges brought about by COVID-19. Uh, since DOSCON Orange, we have organized sessions to help charities strengthen their leadership capability and capacity in addressing these challenges. We have also on the MVPC side um, uh, facilitated digital fundraising efforts through the waiver of transaction fees on giving.sg and this complements efforts like the enhanced fundraising program by Toteport and the government. Uh, we have also going to offer and have offered complimentary pulse check to help strengthen MPO leadership and the first 100 charities to sign up before the end of the year uh, will be able to do pulse check for free. Um, as the external environment is so uncertain and dynamic, uh, if charities need new talent at the board level to help them navigate through this period, uh, CMPL offers a board match program specially designed to help charities identify candidates to serve as independent board and committee members. So it's um, really uh, a time where MVPC and CMPL remain committed to walk this journey with our charity partners to overcome the COVID-19 pandemic together. Uh, we are working on other initiatives and will welcome your feedback on what else we can do to support you during this very difficult period. Um, finally, let me say a heartfelt thanks to the co-organizers, uh, Law Society Pro Bono Services and Singapore Corporate Council Association for their partnership and hard work in putting together this webinar. Uh, and a special thanks also to the speakers, Mr. Adrian Tan, Mr. Renita Krasta, and our moderator, Serene Gan. And to all webinar participants, thank you for taking time to attend this webinar. I, for one, am looking forward to learning from some of the best lawyers in Singapore and being part of an engaging and fruitful session. So I wish you all a very pleasant afternoon. Thank you very much. Back to you, Serene. Uh, thank you, Mr. So. The COVID-19 pandemic has an unprecedented impact on businesses, including the charity sector. In response, the Singapore government has passed the COVID-19 Temporary Measures Act to bring temporary relief to businesses. Vinita, could you give us a quick snapshot of what is the COVID-19 Act? Yeah, thanks very much, Sereen, and um, thanks, Tony, as well, for the warm welcome, uh, as well as, you know, uh, glad to be here with fellow panellists, uh, Adrian, on, on, uh, for this webinar. Uh, I think certainly this topic is very timely, given all the changes that have been happening and the impact that it has had across all our organisations, uh, whether business or in the charity sector. Um, and, and, you know, uh, I think Adrian and myself both, you know, having uh, been involved with various of the charities, we too have been asked many of these questions over time. So as a brief overview, um, beyond the initial adjustments that I think many of us as organizations had to go through uh, at the start of Circuit Breaker, ensuring safe distancing, uh, trying to figure out which of our operations can continue, uh, as well as, you know, e even ensuring that uh, which, which of our volunteers can go to ground um, we, I think now that we have got a little bit of the hang of that, uh, we want to take a little bit more of an in-depth look at some of the recent legislation that has uh, come about. And this webinar really looks at, in particular, the COVID-19 Temporary Measures Act, which seeks to offer temporary relief. Uh, it's sort of, uh, as Tony mentioned, you know, a breathing space that the government has put in place for a period of six months to businesses and individuals who are unable to perform certain types of contracts uh, that are due to be performed on or after 1st February 2020. And there is also a further requirement in the Act that these obligations must have been entered into before 25th March 2020. So uh, if I can go on to the next slide. 
Yeah, so I think with that, we do note that the obligations still remain to be performed. They are just merely delayed for a period of those six months, and certain payments like late interest charges and so on may still apply. They do apply to certain types of contracts here. It's broadly mentioned, uh, secured loan agreements, construction contracts and supply contracts, event contracts. Uh, more relevant to us sometimes is higher purchase contracts as well as leases. Um, so it is important to note that therefore, uh, if you have a payment owing in January, for example, it is still due and payable at the point of January. But if it is a payment that came up in February onwards, these are payments that you could possibly uh, delay for the period of six months. Uh, moving on to the next slide. So what, what this really means is that uh, the party, if you are entitled to certain relief or breathing space under the Act, you can actually serve a notice on the other party to the contract to delay those obligations. And when you uh, serve that, that notice, uh, the, the other party will then be forced to consider what exactly are the um, you know, uh, reasonable options that they may agree to with you during that period of time. Of course, if you, are not, uh, if you are not able to come to an agreement with the other party, you may then uh, appeal to what we call an assessor for determination on what is the outcome of the proper position between both parties. Further to that, we note that there is an amendment bill. And in this amendment bill, there was further relief that has been granted to many of us, uh, which is, could be in the form of rental relief, a statutory repayment schedule, or allowance to hold over premises. So in terms of rental relief, uh, for certain types of properties, you may be entitled between two to four months of rental rebate, which would be jointly borne by both the government as well as the organization, uh, the landlords. Uh, at the same time, a statutory repayment schedule has been put in place, which allows for you to have a longer period of repayment. So let's say for six months, you hold off making certain repayments, but at the end of the six months, you still need to make that payment. And at that point of time, if you're not, not able to, you can enter into a repayment schedule with your, for example, landlord or other party that you owe, uh, to sort of pay in installments over a period of up to nine months. So that is quite a, a relief that has been provided under the Act. And likewise, uh, in terms of uh, premises specifically, there is also uh, an ability to, to um, hold over on certain premises. So for those who may be uh, in a more specific situation where you have to leave your premises, uh, you do have an extended period, slightly longer period for you to reinstate those premises and you will not have to pay uh, double rent. So all in all, I think um, you know, the, the Act also goes on to uh, put a cap on late payment charges and provide various reliefs for certain delays that may have been caused by various contracts. Uh, and I think in the course of today, as we go through the various scenarios, we will also see uh, these in more detail. Uh, Serene? Thank you, Renita. We want to adopt a problem-solving approach in this webinar. As such, we have crafted three scenarios that a charity is likely to encounter. We will discuss the application of the Act and practical tips in approaching these issues. Let's open up the webinar with the first scenario, events-related agreements. To prepare for a charity event in June 2020, Charity X received 10,000 donation from, from company A to sponsor the cost of the charity event, received monies from guests who purchased a ticket to attend the event, entered into a contract with the hotel dated 1st January 2020 and paid a deposit, entered into a contract with a performer dated 1st April 2020. Due to COVID-19, the hotel informed Charity X that the event has to be cancelled and the hotel will not be refunding the deposit. The performer insists on being paid as he has cleared his schedule for the event. This is a problem rather unique to charities because of the fundraising element. Adrian, um, appreciate any thoughts you might have on what Charity X should do with Companies A's donation. You know, this problem that, that you've given me is a really common problem. Um, I was involved with um, Law Society's pro bono uh, office, and we were doing 
a charity fundraising called Just Laugh. And guess what? It's the same situation. What we did was we booked a hotel, um, we sold tickets for donors, and they bought tables and they auctioned for items. And we paid um, Hosan Leong to come and perform at our events. So uh, everyone, please uh, buy tickets for Just Laugh. Well, you should have bought tickets. And then the pandemic struck. So um, that, that's, that's the first headache that we had. Um, what do we do with this situation? So the first thing is um, we should got to divide up the problem. So there are three basic problems. There's a problem of us paying for the venue. Uh, we've already paid for some of it, and um, we can't go ahead with the, with the venue. Number two is there's a problem with paying the performer. And number three is what about those donations that we collected? How, how do we deal with that? Okay, um, maybe we talk about the, uh, which one should we talk about first, Serene? Because there's so many problems. Sure. Um, maybe let's uh, talk first about the donations from the company okay. A and the ticket okay. sales. All right. So, um, so we have company A and mm. Charity X. And yes. um, I got to tell you, Charity X has got to change its branding because if you're a charity and you call yourself Charity X, that's really unhelpful. There's no sense of identity. Um, it sounds like one of those um, mm. X-Men mutant charities for retired mutants. <laughs> So Charity X went ahead and correct, collected donations from Company A. Yes. Um, let's, okay, big question. What are the terms and conditions listed in that donation? So the number one rule is, if you get a donation for a specific purpose, then you gotta use the money donated for that purpose. You can't use it for any other purpose. So in this case, if, Charity X had gone to company A and said, oh, I'm from Charity X. We do all these wonderful causes. Can you donate to us? Then that's fine. That's okay. They, uh, Charity X can take the donation from company A and then go ahead and um, use it for charitable purposes. But let's say Charity X uh, goes to company A and says, okay, um, we're going to do something very specific. We've booked um, Fairmont Hotel and We've booked a performer, Hosan Leong, and it's on this date, which is the 1st of May, let's say. And uh, we want a donation for that, to do exactly that. Then company A will say, okay, um, I like that hotel, I like that performer, and that date works for me because of feng shui reasons or the anniversary of my company. So that date is super important for me. So on those conditions, I will give you a huge donation. Now, if that happens, then there's a big problem because you got to use that money for that specific purpose. And if you don't, then what can you do? You have to refund. You have to refund the donation. Now, here's, here's a, weird, uh, a weird question. What if the, um, the money is asked from the public? You know, you, get, you tell the public, oh, okay, I'm doing, I'm doing a show on, on this day with this performer at this hotel. And can you donate? And then you get an anonymous donor who, or, or members of the public who go on a, uh, a website and just donate without giving their names. So you've got a whole bunch of money for a specific purpose. Now, if you can't go ahead and do this, then you've got to return the money. But since the donors are anonymous, you can't return the money. So this is a problem that you have to ask the commissioner of charity. So the commissioner of charities will have to uh, give directions as to what to do with that money. Well, what's a quick fix for this in future? So lawyers like to look at things with hindsight and say, you did so many things wrong. But here's a fix for in future, whatever fundraising you're doing, you've got to have terms and conditions with a special clause that says, look, if for any reason I can't go ahead and do this, I can still keep your donation and do something else that's in line with my charitable purposes. So once we have such a flexible clause inside, that should help. Thanks, Adrian. I think that's a really useful tip because I think for some organizations, they're looking to planning their future events um, starting now. So it's good to take note that, you know, in the future to make sure 
that you know in terms of receiving donations you have so-called a, a fallback clause or different purposes you can use the monies from so i suppose you know when it comes to the ticket sales obviously it's it's very vague right in the sense that you are buying a ticket to attend an event so um, does that fall under the same situation where you need to go to the charities commissioner in terms of what to do with the money? Or can you just take it that, hey, you know, um, they're buying this ticket to support the charity, so surely we can use it, uh, or do we need to do something about it? So if we sell tickets and we say in the tickets that mm. the tickets uh, are sold for the purposes of raising funds, for the charity let's say you've stated that very clearly you're not really talking about a dinner or event but you're just saying that all the proceeds from ticket sales will be used to uh, um, for our charitable purposes then that's okay to keep it it's okay to keep it but what's uh, another possibility sometimes is people solicit donations and then they say if you donate x dollars we will give you tickets they'll give you tickets free is it slightly different and that's fine as well um, then the money you get will be an outright donation and in fact some donors will use it to claim uh, tax benefits oh, uh, yes. and, and you've got to figure out whether uh, you get the tickets in return the donor has to figure out with IRAs whether this this is um, some sort of benefit or not so those two scenarios, you're okay to keep the donations. Scenario one, if you say, I'm collecting money just for a charitable event. And scenario two, I'm collecting money and I'm giving you tickets free. And that's the sort of approach I advise charities to take. So say that you're giving the tickets in return for a donation. You've got to work out the terms and conditions and legal language very carefully. The yes. big problem comes if you say, we are selling you a ticket for an event then that's a different thing. Then this is not really a donation. You're just holding an event. You're no different from a commercial organization and you're holding an event and then you're selling tickets for the event. So if you, if, if you can't go ahead to do it, then you got to refund the money. That's, that's the simple uh, situation. Thanks, Adrian. I think that that gives a, I guess, a more realistic approach because, you know, it's not a one one size fit all um, approach because it really depends on, you know, what was said or what was in the terms when you were trying to seek donations. And I thought, and I thought a really important point you brought up was, you know, for some corporate donors, they are actually using it to claim um, for certain tax benefits. So they do have to consider that it's not so straightforward as they get the money back. They, the donors do have to consider um, about the tax as well. Um, you know, I guess maybe the more fundamental question, which I think most charities are facing is, you know, can the hotel actually cancel the event and forfeit the deposit? Right, right. Um, so this is a big question. Um, the answer is uh, the whole relief comes about um, if you it's to suspend performance of contracts if it's due to the COVID nineteen pandemic. Now, what are the facts here? Now we enter into the contract. I, uh, it's on first of January, so it's before the pandemic, and um, and then we have this pandemic and we can't go ahead. So Charity X can invoke relief under the Act um, because in a sense, this is a contract for a venue and an event. It was entered into before the 25th March deadline. So the Act stipulates a 25th March deadline. If you enter into the contract before the 25th March deadline, you can claim relief. If you enter into the contract after the 25th March deadline, different. And finally, the event, which was, is supposed to take place after 1st of February. So if it's in June 2020, in our scenario A, then it's after 1st of February. So in this case, the charity has met the two magic dates. The first mm -hmm. magic date is 25th March, and the second magic date is 1st of February. So the hotel, uh, sorry, not the hotel, the charity. And finally, the charity has to say, well, we, uh, the events can't go ahead because mm -hmm. of COVID-19. 
So if the event can't go ahead because of some other reason, then it's not right for, for anyone to use the COVID-19 Temporary Measures Act for relief. It's all about whether the pandemic caused your inability to perform. So um, all these uh, events are triggered, then Charity X can invoke relief under the Act. The hotel cannot forfeit the deposit. But here's a complication. Sometimes the hotel mm. says, you've got to think for the hotel as well. The hotel sure. says, hey, look, you know, you asked me to, to book this event uh, for, let's say, 400 guests. And let's say they have certain dietary requirements. So I had to, to start buying my supplies. And I actually um, hired extra weight staff and uh, extra, extra staff, in fact, to cater for this event, which is, which is coming up. As a responsible hotel, I got to do that. Um, so what do I do? I mean, I've already paid money to my suppliers to, to buy food for your event. And I've also paid money uh, uh, to, to, to wait staff to hire them. And these people, uh, they're freelancers and they need jobs. So what do we do? And the answer is, um, actually, the, the law doesn't tell us what to do with that deposit. So the, the hotel is entitled to say, I am not going to forfeit your whole deposit but I need to keep some of it because I've already gone out of pocket. Because of your booking, I've gone ahead to buy food and hire people. So I can't take money back from that. And why should I lose out because of this situation that's beyond our control? So um, if Charity X invokes relief and seeks uh, what they call a notification for relief from the hotel, um, that means Charity X is invoking the COVID-19 Act then the hotel can uh, put in its, its defense. And then what happens in this procedure is that um, parties are supposed to get together to negotiate on some kind of compromise. If they can't agree on a compromise, then the parties can apply for an assessor to make a determination. But in this sort of case, I strongly advise people to have a commercial compromise, which is um, the hotel should be able to uh, keep some of the deposit to pay for the suppliers and the wait staff. Mm. Actually, one question we just received from a participant is that, you know, that you know you do have this COVID nineteen act, and you also do have the contract that you enter into with the hotels. So yes. in those, you know, unfortunately, in most contracts for hotels, generally the hotel tends to have the discretion in terms of whether they refund the deposit or the deposit is non-refundable. So the participant did ask that, look, uh, the hotel is coming back to me and saying, look, our policy is that we only refund if your deposit is of a certain amount. Otherwise, we refuse to refund. So I was wondering, oh. what's the interplay of this COVID-19 Act versus what is in the contract? Oh, that's a great question, Serene. So um, the first thing to do is we have to look carefully at the terms of the contract, not the hotel's policy. Because whenever, I'm, I'm not just picking on hotels, but whenever sure. any business comes along and says, oh, our policy is this, mm. what they're really saying is, we don't have any legal rights. So we're going to lean on some invisible concept called a policy. Don't fall for that. All right. Policy means nothing in law. Go back to the contract. Now, in this case, if the charity booked an event with the hotel, then the first thing to do is go and look at the contract. Mm -hmm. Now, if it's drafted by the, by the hotel or the venue, then of course, it'll be leaning towards the venue or the hotel. But the, the, the charity should still go and read the terms carefully. And it might say something like, oh, if you don't go ahead the event, we can forfeit the deposit. What if, um, and, and then we have to see whether the act comes in to help us. Remember the magic dates? Yes. Uh, we have to, yes. So look at that. But number two is, um, what if people pay more than a deposit? You know, some, sometimes people pay the whole amount, the, the, whole, the whole expense, not just a, a small or partial deposit. Then is it, is it uh, possible that the venue keeps the whole amount? Probably not, if you satisfy the, the, the relief but you got to look at the terms and conditions. Sometimes um, you can use what is called a 
a force majeure exception. Mm, to yes. So actually, what's the, you know, does this concept of force majeure, so how does that, uh, does it apply to COVID-19? Well, um, yeah, the concept of force majeure uh, means if something happens mm. that is considered to be an act outside the control of human beings, outside the control of human beings, which uh, all lawyers call an act of God, yeah. um, outside the control of human beings, yes. then that will excuse people from performing their contractual obligations. So in this case, we're not uh, talking about the act of human beings. COVID-19 is an act of animals, bats, viruses. No human beings were involved in the creation of this virus. So it's certainly the most major of force major acts. So you can use this concept to argue that you don't have to perform your contract. And in fact, um, the government's COVID-19 bill um, is actually a way of acknowledging to the business community that we're dealing with a very big force majeure. So for force majeure, is it something that you must specify in a contract in order for it to take effect? Or is it something where even if it's not a contract, you can still rely on this? Wow, okay. So um, people have been arguing about this for a million years. And um, yeah, since, since majeure existed, um, mm. And the idea is this, if you put force majeure in your contract, then it could be a problem because some people write force majeure as um, any strikes, wars, riots, blah, blah, and they list out the stuff that force majeure covers. Now, if you list out the stuff that force majeure covers, sometimes it can be argued that we just have to follow that list. So if you wrote in your list in force majeure, riots, wars, and nothing else, then a pandemic won't be covered. So you can't use that. Um, but sometimes people write in their force majeure clauses, uh, force majeure, including but not limited to riots and wars, blah, blah. Mm. Then you can use that force majeure clause. So sometimes it's better not even to have a force majeure clause and argue that it is implied. Um, the, the thing now, I know all transactional lawyers are going to do is they're going to go back and word their force majeure clauses to include this word epidemic or pandemic. And that's going to be the thing that COVID-19 has gifted us, this new word. Yeah, it sounds like, you know, in the sense this act is useful because, you know, you may not have provided for it in the contract or, you know, even if you provided for it, it may not have covered pandemics. I think one popular question that we're receiving from uh, participants on this uh, webinar is that, you know, right now it seems like, you know, it's clear that, the, for example, the hotel, they cannot forfeit the deposit. It's up to parties how they negotiate in terms of what they do with the deposit. Um, but I think for, you know, that, you know, some commercial solutions would be to postpone the event. So I think right now the question on everyone's mind is, is it likely that the government or, or have you heard uh, whether the government will extend the application of this act or pretty much after this act is over that you know everyone has to figure out commercially how to deal with the situation so there's no news and i i think that this is one of those situations where no one knows what tomorrow will bring uh, what yes. we know for sure is that um right now uh, phase two is starting on friday yay so there's going to be a mad rush for bubble yes. tea and you know um um people eating openly with each other and using the same chopsticks and other joys of Asian dining. Yes. But uh, uh, we don't know whether we can still have events. So um, in our present situation, the, the one that um, Law Society had, uh, our pro bono office negotiated with the hotel, Fairmont Hotel, was very nice. They said, don't worry, you tell us when you can come back and do your event. We, we still want to have this good relationship with you because uh, we want to think long term. And that's a wonderful attitude. So I, I think we've got to leverage on that. And we've got to go back and say to the venues, um, I'm so sorry, we can't do the event as scheduled, but can you help us? We want to still do the event with you, but at a later date, and we don't even know when that date will be. So please don't forfeit anything. Uh, please um, let us book a date with you when everything has cleared up. And that, that is a good way of 
trying to resolve the dispute. Because if you look at it from the venue's perspective, they're, they're all bleeding. Uh, they still want to have a business after the circuit breaker is over. Mm. So they want to have a, a good relationship with their customers. And you can, you can negotiate with the venue to say, look, if you guys do this for us, we're going to go on our social media and say, oh, this is a wonderful venue. Uh, we had this problem because of COVID-19, but um, this venue was so kind to us and they allowed us to go ahead and reschedule it for a later date at no, at no expense. And doing that is, is, has two benefits. One, you're giving something to the venue, but two, you're locking them down so they can't change their mind. You're announcing publicly mm. that they've agreed to this. So uh, that's a sneaky, non-legal way of binding people. Yes, I mean, it does sound like, um, you know, because the Act left it pretty open for parties to find a commercial, you know, um, solution, that I think really for this is really trying to find different commercial approaches. And I think one of which is is what, as you suggested, um, you know, highlighting to the hotel in terms of, you know, it's just, it's just not about dollars and cents. It's also about the relationship and also your reputation. Um, I think one other question raised by a participant is that with all these safe distancing measures, granted phase two, um, certain things are open, um, but you know it's expected that um, safe distancing of maybe seating people further apart is expected oh. to continue. And also, I think uh, maybe you know instead of buffet style, you need to be um, you know given um, you need to give out proportions. So I guess correspondingly on the hotel side that might lead to more cost in terms of, you know, having a bigger room or more manpower. So in such a situation, you know, hotels may come back saying, um, you know, we, we can't really accommodate you um, unless you pay more or, or maybe the hotel might be saying, hey, we're not able to um, fulfill all these requirements. So you need to cut down the number of uh, attendees. Do you have any thoughts on this? Oh, Serene, that's a great point. So we have to reimagine how these big events are going to happen in future. So in the old days, pre-COVID, uh, the template was quite simple. You have this row of uh, dishes on the side table. It's basically yes. cold fried rice and stone hard chicken wings and satay that cannot be pulled off a stick. And that's pretty standard. And then people sort of mill around and then mm. they sit near each other. Or the second template is everyone sits uh, around the round table and then the wait staff bring out this huge um, dish. This is a Chinese style dining and everyone digs in from the dish in the center and, and some uh, very polite and courteous hosts will uh, take food from the center dish and put it on your plate to show you that you're an honored guest. Stuff like that. We can't do stuff like that anymore. And you're right, hotels and venues have to reimagine. Number one is, do we really have to um, eat all the time when we meet? Can we just have an event where people not focus on food for a while? Because food looks like it's a super vector for this disease. So they have to mm. reimagine. Maybe we, we sit further apart. Uh, maybe we get little packaged food. I know it sounds horrible. And then we try and focus on, on the event or the discussion instead of focusing on eating. So I, I think mm. uh, uh, charities and, and, and me, myself, we have to reimagine what works in this post-COVID society, but definitely the buffets are out. Mm, I see. But I think that's a pretty good um, suggestion in that, you know, if let's say, you know, in terms of trying to work out the cost or um, how to do it because uh, safe distancing is required, maybe you need to have a relook or we think about how you would have the event. As you said, maybe it's not a dinner, maybe it could be uh, stand-up cocktails or maybe it could be just uh, watching a performance. Uh, maybe one last question before I, I move on uh, to the next scenario is that, okay, let's say we do come to a commercial compromise between the hotel and the charity. So, you know, must we record it down um, somewhere, like maybe a documentation, you know, so that both parties are bound by it? I mean, what, what do you suggest, um, you know, uh, that we should do in this situation? Okay, that's, that's a great point. So um, definitely it's important to document the understanding mm -hmm. for a couple of reasons. One, um, between the charity and the commercial organization, you always need to write things down. It can be an email to say okay we've agreed on this variation of the contract but the second reason is you got to document it because you're a well-run charity right so in SABH uh, the Singapore Association of the Visually Handicapped 
where I've been helping out. Um, it's one of the oldest charities in Singapore. And every time when we try and look at why decisions were made, even a short few years ago, it's hard if it's not documented. So um, charities go on forever, but the boards, the ex -cos, the directors, we move on. So whatever decisions you make this year regarding your venue, you have to document it for the sake of the people coming after you so that they can read mm -hmm. and understand. Okay, because of this, the previous contract was varied to that. I really want to encourage um, all charities to have a good system of governance by documenting decisions, especially this type of crucial decisions in this time. Give your decision, but also give the reasons behind the decisions and what other options you consider. So you, you've got to document it somewhere in a meeting in minutes that, all right, um, I'm, I'm coming back to report to you on our encounter mm. with the hotel. Yes. Um, the hotel wants to uh, um, forfeit, but we negotiated with them not to forfeit. And in fact, we came to this compromise and here are the terms of the compromise. Uh, so they will take some of our deposit, but not all of it. And, and the reason we, we went to that is because we asked them not to take the whole deposit, uh, but they wouldn't agree and stuff like that. Put it down so that uh, the people who come after you will know that you tried your best. You tried your best for the charity, and this is the best outcome that could have been managed. Mm. Thank you, Adrian. I think that's very helpful. Uh, I know this is a very hot topic, and we have received a lot of questions, but maybe we'll circle back on this during the Q&A section. Um, let's move on to the next scenario, um, which is on landlord and tenant. Um, before I read the scenario, uh, just a gentle reminder that we have provided some useful handouts. Uh, so please download them before the end of the seminar. So the landlord and tenant situation. Charity A rents its premises from the landlord and sublets part of its premises to Charity B. Due to COVID-19, Charities A and B receive fewer donations. Charity A is unable to pay rent due to fewer donations and non-payment of rent by Charity B. Landlord insists on payment of the rent and refuses to offset Charity A's security deposit against its arrears. Charity B receives a demand from Charity A for payment of its rent. So this is your typical uh, landlord-tenant situation, but with a twist because, you know, Possibly Charity A might have needed to share the premises in order to pay the rent to the landlord. Uh, perhaps let's get Renita's view on this. Um, Renita, does Charity A have to pay rent? Yeah, thanks, thanks, Serene. I think uh, uh, this is quite a, a familiar scenario now. I think because you know uh, rent does form one of the largest components of most of our operating costs. Uh, rent and sometimes manpower. So um, definitely, I think this is a um, an aspect of you know our cost that many of our organizations uh, are considering, uh, considering carefully. And uh, I think in in short to this um, scenario, uh, it it really depends on uh, you know whether the tenant charity A would fall under the COVID uh, temporary measures act. So, um, you know, in I think really the beauty of the Act is that it has allowed that breathing space I mentioned earlier uh, of that six months so that during that period of the six months, the Charity A can possibly, if they are not able to pay their rent, they can serve a notice on the landlord to um, inform them that, you know, they are not able to pay and that these payments would have to be deferred. So, so that I think is one of the immediate reliefs brought about by the Act. And also by the amendments to the Act, uh, if you can't pay even at the end of that six-month period in October, you can then uh, go on an instalment schedule to, to pay on a further nine-month instalment payment uh, mode. So I think this does give uh, some form of good rental relief uh, for, for most tenants. Yeah. So, for, um, so I think it's quite clear that Charity A can rely on um, the COVID-19 Act. So for Charity B, um, it's a sub-tenant and its landlord is another charity. So does the Act also apply to um, Charity B? Can Charity B um, also rely on Act and not pay rent? Yeah, so the same would apply for Charity B. I think what I would uh, point out importantly is that 
uh, when we say that they qualify for the act, they do have to check certain things. So like earlier we mentioned, you know, these must be for obligations after the 1st of February. They must be in relation to contracts before the 25th of March. Mm -hmm. uh, they also have to be uh, in relation to those, uh, uh, they also have to be uh, in relation to, they have to be able to demonstrate a situation that has been brought about by COVID. So for example, if it was a business situation that does not relate to COVID, which is causing the, the failure of your business, uh, and so even from a period prior to February, you were not able to pay your rent, then you may or may not be able to rely on the relief under this act. Uh, because what you need to show clearly is the extent and the um, importance of your organization having been affected by COVID. So for example, if you say that you, know, you are not uh, able to fundraise during this period of time, uh, that would be an example of showing that you, know, you have been affected by COVID and therefore uh, you, you need to actually put in this request for rental relief from your landlords. Yeah. Mm. Um, I think one question we have from the participant who I think uh, sympathize with the current scenario is that they do have um, security deposit with the landlord. Hence, they're asking the landlord, please, can you just use the security deposit? So does the act mandate or require the landlord to um, first use the security deposit before turning to the tenant for rent? Yeah, so I think, um, unfortunately, at, at the moment, the, the Act doesn't go that far to, to change any terms and conditions that have already been agreed to. But what it does by giving relief, you know, uh, what it does mean is that during this period of time, um, the, ten the landlord should not be forfeiting your security deposit or, um, you know, trying to re-enter the premises and take back the premises because they, they should be giving you additional time to make those payments. Uh, as for the request of actually asking the landlord to use the security deposit first, uh, this is quite a commercial arrangement. There are mm. some bigger landlords that are considering this uh, and, and they have, you know, you, I think it's always beneficial. I think as Adrian pointed out in the previous scenario as well, um, I think when we are in organizations, we are very aware that it's uh, legal does, uh, you know, terms and conditions are quite important, but the business aspect of the relationships and commercial discussions are equally important. So I think definitely, um, while legally, you may not have that right to ask uh, whether by the contract or by law to ask the landlord to apply the security deposit first, um, you, you would want to try to initiate that commercial discussion to, um, you know, to really try to discuss the various options uh, that could be taken. Uh, mm. So one way is asking for the security deposit to be used first. Uh, another way is to, even beyond the act, to ask for an even longer uh, period of repayment. Um, and, and of course, there may be various other measures you might want to discuss with the landlord, including uh, for some tenants, there is that possibility of uh, downsizing or moving to alternative, alternative types of spaces. So um, I think these are very realistic, discuss realistic discussions uh, that may or may not be accepted by all landlords, but I think at least we should get that conversation going. Yeah. Thanks, Renita. I, I think what's really useful about uh, what you said was basically some maybe practical and commercial suggestions because the law can only help you so far. Um, and if you want to go beyond that, it's good to engage with your landlord to start that conversation going. Um, one practical question that we receive from the audience is that, you know, for some tenants, they actually do gyro or have a standard standing order uh, with the landlord. So every month without fail, there'll be a standard um, deduction for the rent. So given this situation where, you know, they feel that they might want to rely on the act or not pay rent due to the COVID-19 situation, uh, would they be able to terminate this gyro arrangement and maybe go back to old school and just, uh, you know, send a check over? Yeah, so I think the, the process is quite important in this. Uh, there is a form which is also available uh, on the MinLaw website. Uh, and, and this form really is what the notice that you need to serve on the landlord or to any other party you have such contracts with. Um, you know, the notice that you need to serve to first, uh, and, and it actually sets out, you know, uh, what are you not paying for, uh, the reason, and, and so on. And so I think uh, that notice, to be fair to the landlord, first has to be served uh, before you would want to take any other form of action. 
Um, mm. So so we do need to be mindful that because the terms and conditions of the contract still continue, um, you know, if you and if you if you do so before you serve that notice, you may still be liable for and you put, would still be liable for, for example, late payment, interest charges, and so on. So uh, the situation does need to be discussed with the landlord. Um, and and to put them on notice. Of course, the the landlord should not unreasonably uh, refuse for you to pay, especially during uh, for you to delay payment, especially during these uh, six months period, because um, during the six months it is mandated by the act that they have to give you that breathing space. Uh, and mm. so, as soon as you uh, get that awareness that the landlord has been notified, you may then you know take steps to discontinue and and discuss further with the landlord. I think uh, one last question, um, you know, given our scenario where, you know, this is maybe for those charities who are sub-tenants or sub-licenses, um, you know, they're in an interesting situation where even if they pay their rent to the main tenant, but the tenant chooses not to pay rent to their landlord, um, you know, is there any practical uh, advice or approach that Charity B should do? Because um, you know, they. I mean, they want. They don't want to be caught in a situation where they pay rent to charity A, but charity A doesn't in turn pay the rent to charity B. I mean, to the landlord, and they find that their lease is terminated. Yeah, that, that's quite an interesting scenario. I think even during uh, non-COVID times, in a sense, uh, sometimes subtenants are in that precarious position where they may not have that direct relationship with the landlord. Um, I, I think with with uh, even in the usual times, I think uh, it would be useful to set up, uh, you know, to to if you really have uh, reasons to believe that the tenant above you is not making payments and that there's danger of you having to leave the premises, uh, you may want to reach out and try to speak to the landlord directly. Uh, but even at law, I think um, you know the the reason sometimes some of the terms and conditions are. Uh, framed in a certain way is because the landlord does have to uh, take reasonable measures, you know, before uh, they take certain acts, especially in relation to taking back of premises. So um, while there are certain clauses to say, of course, if there is a breach, they can take back the space. There is also, um, you know, they do have to be seen to be taking reasonable measures, especially if a subtenant is there or if there is uh, goods and equipment within the premises. They would have to serve the relevant amount of notices, uh, and likely, I think, for the landlord as well, if they do want to continue to receive that rent, they may well be uh, willing to enter into a negotiation with this subtenant uh, into a direct contract uh, for the portion of the premises, or whether it's the full or portion of the premises that the subtenant is occupying. So um, a lot of these then can be worked out through that negotiation process, but also by law, there is that degree of protection. Yeah. Mm. Thank you, Renita. Um, let's go on to our last um, scenario. Um, so our last scenario is for higher purchase agreement. Charity X delivers its goods to customers with a van purchased under a higher purchase agreement dated 1st January 2020, but it has failed to make payment of its first installment due on 31st January 2020. A truck rented under a rental agreement and a car that is purchased by Charity X founder John under a higher purchase agreement. Due to COVID-19, Charity X and John are unable to pay the motor companies as Charity X business and donations have dropped. The motor companies issued them a notice to repossess the vehicles. Let's get um, Adrian's thoughts on this topic so Adrian, uh, does Charity X have to, you know, comply the notice and, you know, pay for the vehicles? So let's start with the van. Mm. So uh, remember, we have to look at the magic dates. Uh, the yeah. van is a commercial vehicle purchased under a higher purchase agreement. So got that. Um, and it was a higher purchase agreement made on 1st of January 2020. So that meets the magic date of before 25th March 2020. So any contract before 25th March 2020 is captured. And the next magic date is you can't fulfill your obligations from 1st of February 2020. From 1st of February 2020. So in the case of the van, they're supposed to pay the first installment 
on 31st January 2020. It's mm. one day before the magic date of 1st February 2020. So too bad the act doesn't help you there. Mm. So Charity X for the van, yes, it is a, a commercial vehicle. Yes, it's under high purchase. Yes, it was a contract entered before 25th March, but too bad. Um, they have to pay that 31st January 2020 installment. The act doesn't I think help. That's a, I think that's a very good uh, reminder that although the help, the act is very helpful, but it's not going to rescue you if you did not or you breached your obligations prior to, as you said, the magic dates. Yes, yes, it can't be helped. I mean, we have to draw a line somewhere and the mm. government said, okay, uh, we'll choose February. Um, and so stuff that happened before 1st of February 2020, you're on your own. But stuff that happened from 1st of February 2020, you can get help if, if, and this is the final if, if you can't pay because of COVID-19, not if you can't pay for any other reasons. Um, on the other hand, let's look at the truck, you know, the, the yes. next vehicle on the list. The truck, um, yes, it's a commercial vehicle. Um, yes. Was it purchased under a higher purchase agreement? Oops, no, it's not bought under higher purchase. It's rented. So uh, that's, that's not covered by the COVID-19 Temporary Measures Act. Uh, it doesn't cover any rented vehicles. Um, what are you going to do? Well, if you, if you want to, you can look at the terms of your rental agreement. And I think most of the times after the minimum period specified in the rental agreement, you can return the truck and stop paying mm. rent after that. that. That's as much as we can do. Uh, finally, there is a car. So uh, yes. there's, this, there's this third vehicle, which is purchased under a higher purchase agreement. So wonderful. It's not rented. It's purchased under a higher purchase agreement. Hmm, but it's not a commercial vehicle, it's a car. So because it's not a commercial vehicle, then the act doesn't help the founder, John, to stop paying for his higher purchase um, on his car. And even if he uses his car exclusively for the, uh, uh, for the charity, that's still too bad because it's not a, a, a goods vehicle then it's not covered. Thank you so much, Adrian. Okay, um, I think that concludes this scenario. So thank you, Renita and Adrian, for walking us through the different scenarios. Let's move on to the Q&A. As a reminder to our participants, you can submit questions through the questions pane on your screen. I also remind you that you can download the handouts uh, before the end of the webinar. Let's move on to the first question. I think uh, the event's topic is a very uh, relevant and hot topic. So one question that came up, um, I think among several participants, is that the hotels may not be located in Singapore. They may be dealing with hotels located overseas. So let's say, for example, you know, they had um, some sort of retreat or they had some sort of event, but it's with a hotel in, let's say, Malaysia. So does the act um, apply or, or is of any use? Um, well, I am so sorry, but um, it's going to be difficult to apply this act to a hotel in Malaysia. I, I'm interested to hear also Renita's view on this because of her experience and background in, in, in all these uh, different types of sectors. But I, I think that our, our law doesn't go overseas. So it's not an export item. The, uh, but what's good is, let's say the Malaysian hotel uh, wants to sue uh, the charity in Singapore for, uh, for non-performance of the contract, and they come to the Singapore courts to sue. Then the Singapore uh, courts can listen to an argument uh, that says, okay, we want to extend the application of this act to all contracts, whether with external parties or, or Singapore parties. Um, mm. Now, if, they, if the Malaysian hotel brings a lawsuit in Singapore, then it is possible that the Singapore charity can, can put up an argument. But mm, I'm not so sure. Renita, sure. do you know if there's like similar um, 
sort of legislation around the world to cover this? Maybe we're the first. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think it really depends on the jurisdiction and uh, I, I am not sure our webinar is <laughs> wide enough to cover uh, all the different acts. So different countries, I mean, whether it's UK, Europe, uh, US, they do have a certain amount of uh, relief. Uh, but uh, in Asia, it, it really depends. And, and so I, I think this would have to be considered in depth. Uh, but definitely under our act, uh, it does not extend extraterritorially, as Adrian has said. Yeah, so it's pretty much for, for leases or contracts that are right here in Singapore. Um, and, and I think uh, as, with, as with all else, you know, then a fair degree of commercial negotiation uh, and understanding with the landlords do have to be taken. Um, I, I think that uh, in the earlier period uh, of Circuit Breaker, there was uh, a little bit of uh, more, in, in some sense, uh, maybe misunderstanding with some landlords or, or um, maybe certain landlords are a bit slow to uh, in, in some of the passing on of rebates and so on. Um, I think part of that reason is also because the extent of, uh, you know, the exact amounts of rebates uh, or reliefs to be given uh, were not so easily determined at that point of time. But I think the law uh, is quite clear now. And um, I think most, most landlords are quite clear that they know that uh, property tax rebates have to be passed on. Uh, and, and this is the amount of rental relief that, that can be given. Uh, but unfortunately for overseas, we, we still need to go on a case-by-case -case basis with the various acts. Yeah. That and reminds me that, that um, it, for all charities and basically for all Singaporean organizations, whenever you sign contracts, um, try to make sure that they are using Singapore law. So that Singapore law is stated to be the governing law. This is because, um, well, we're always trying to push for Singapore law in our contracts with cross-border uh, parties. And that's because we know Singapore law, we know it's fair and transparent, and you know this COVID legislation is super fast and easy to understand. So whenever possible, charities, if you're negotiating with external parties, try and specify that Singapore law applies. Now, if we did this with the Malaysian hotel, mm. there's possibly an argument that you can make that uh, you must uh, allow us to use our COVID-19 measures. So even if you're dealing with external parties, try and use Singapore law. So maybe adding on to this question, uh, another participant asked, you know, in this situation, um, it may not be the charity directly contracting with the hotel um, in Malaysia. It could be that the charity is going through a Singapore travel agent. So if they're going through a Singapore travel agent or, you know, it could be an event management team that's doing this, um, would, would the COVID-19 Act uh, be able to be applied or it's excluded because the hotel or the venue is in Malaysia? Any so, thoughts on that? So in this situation, it's actually very interesting. The charity uses an event management company, which then contracts with um, a, foreign, a foreign venue. Yes. Now, who's the loser in this situation? It's the event management company. Why is that? Because the charity can say to the event management company, I'm dealing with you. I want you to handle everything. So mm. if I have to pay you, I'll use the COVID measures Act, and I'll have some relief from performance. And then the event management company says, oh, then if I go to the foreign party and I say, oh, can I get some relief because of this COVID-19 Temporary Measures Act? The, the foreign party will say, so sorry, uh, what act is this? We don't know. So the event management company is then caught in the middle. And Serene, actually, that's a very good point. In that case, that's a strong argument for uh, charities to use some sort of planner or event manager in the middle to kind of insulate them from all kinds of headaches. And I can see some benefit in that because if we're organizing something, there's the performers, there's the venue, and there's all kinds of other little items. And, and instead of the charity managing all this, the charity can just use a one-stop shop like an event management company. And the mm -hmm. added benefit is that you can then use Singapore law with that company uh, to get some relief. Uh, I, I don't know, uh, Renita, do, do you deal with a lot of uh, such third-party like event management companies when they book for people? Uh, 
Um, yeah, I mean, not not. Uh, I mean, not within uh, my usual work, but I think I think it is true uh, that the the and the intermediate party will be the one who uh, also has um, to have that conversation with the hotels. Uh, and likewise, hopefully, you know, a request can be made to bring in uh, this particular scenario of, of the participant, you know, to, to engage in that conversation. Uh, I mean, specifically speaking on Malaysia, in fact, I think in the past uh, month, they, they themselves have been lobbying their individual states and government for a COVID bill. Uh, but, you know, they, they have not introduced any legislation at the moment. Uh, so, so uh, specifically on this, so I think, um, you know, that that really uh, ha we have to continue to watch that space to see uh, how that may affect us. So again, the act is really uh, quite confined to to having application in Singapore and in the different countries. We have to uh, watch and see what are the different measures that are available. Yeah. Thank you, Renita and Adrian. So I have one question from the audience, um, which may not you know, strictly apply within the, the COVID-19 Act, but I, I think it's a very interesting question. Uh, basically, some charity organizations, uh, they do not directly hire staff. So instead, they go to, let's say, um, uh, outsource company where they provide, let's say, admin support or, or things like that. So the tricky situation is that, you know, recently the government has introduced the job support scheme. So obviously the outsource organization who is hiring these workers would enjoy the benefits of the government subsidy in terms of the pay. However, the charity organization is in a fix because although the government is subsidizing um, the, the pay of these workers, but the charity doesn't benefit, um, and instead the charity would have to pay the full amount continuously to the outsource company. You know, it's, it's a really interesting situation. Um, Adrian and Renita, do you have any thoughts on this? Well, um, what's interesting is that, well, we have this <coughs> job support scheme, which in, in summary, it gives uh, all employers wage subsidies to help cope with um, salary costs during the pandemic. And there are, there are four payout dates, I think April, May, uh, July, and October. So, um, and some, some companies are doing so well that they actually um, don't need this JSS. Um, I think Citibank, Citibank uh, returned yes. its job support scheme. That's very good move there. Um, but charities, we can't do that. So um, we want to benefit from that. The question is very interesting though, because they want to use um, an outsourced company for staff recruitment. What is that? involved well i think um we have to look at the contracts to see how the recruitment is structured but let's say what happens is the charity pays the outsource company a fixed amount and then the outsource company in return is contracted to provide let's say five clerical staff at their own expense then yeah the charity cannot get the benefit of the jss Mm. On the other hand, um, the outsource company is probably going to be getting the benefit of the job support scheme to, to help uh, keep staff employed. So that's already good. It would be really weird if the government pays JSS to the charity and to the outsource company for the same group of workers. Then that's sort of like the taxpayer is paying double. Uh, to keep the same number of people employed. And that's really not the idea. The idea of the JSS, the job support scheme, is based on the employees. How are taxpayers going to help employees stay employed? Not how are various organizations going to pocket money from the government um, um, through all these schemes. So if we focus on the employees, I think mm. it's pretty clear that uh, you can only get one set of JSS for that, those human beings. Understood. I think that's a quite a, a, a good practical point in that um, this, you know, seems to the JSS is seemed targeted more towards uh, the retention of employees. Um, so this is moving on from the events space. I think I received a number of questions from the audience in one form or another. I think they're all trying to seek. Um, I mean, they realize that they have to approach the the hotels um, to seek, um, you know, some sort of commercial compromise or solution. 
So they've so I think one thing they are thinking about is you know is there any suggestions on how they can approach the hotel, um, especially if you know maybe they don't want to have the event anymore. Is is there any way to try and persuade um, the hotel to refund the deposit or to give to other means? So in in one of our uh, situations where we were organizing an event and then the pandemic struck. Um, it was an event that needed to be to, to take place this year because it's every year. So yeah. um, no point us saying, so sorry, uh, we don't want to do this event this year, but we'll do it next year because there's already one scheduled next year. So mm. um, in those situations, we asked the venue to convert the, the, the money that we wanted to use to some other idea. For example, um, if the hotel, instead of, of giving us a venue, uh, can give us credit uh, for the money that was given, and, and we can use this credit in future for, let's say, rooms. Um, let's say if we have people um, uh, visiting us, we can use up this credit and they can give us free rooms or uh, some other side benefit. Maybe it's a chain of hotels around the world. Maybe we can convert this money um, to be used for accommodation when we travel, stuff like that. One day we are going to travel. So uh, yes. I know it's impossible to believe, but one day we're all going to be queuing up in the airport and then fighting to get on e economy class seats and then eating cold sandwiches and sleeping mm. 12 hours next to a stranger whose head is on our shoulder. Yes. And that's something we can all look forward to. But Thank when you. that day comes, we might be able to use those credits. I think another question leading on to this um, is that, you know, I think this one deals more with the donors. So for donors, obviously, when they market an event, uh, normally it could be a combined things. For example, it's a dinner plus performance. It could be a golf tournament plus dinner. So obviously, uh, one element of it, which is the dinner portion, it's a little bit difficult to pull through, especially if you try to make it an online performance instead. So any suggestions in terms of how to approach donors so that donors don't feel that, hey, when I bought the ticket, it was for two main things, which is a dinner plus something else. Um, any suggestions, any thoughts? Again, uh, we're, we're having this, this type of big question for us, when we do our pro bono uh, work with LSPBS um, and the SABH. So maybe ideas would be uh, that we give the donors uh, more publicity in terms of they do a, they do a video with our beneficiaries. And um, so you donate this amount of time and uh, our staff are going to do a social media video, video for you where we showcase your involvement with the charity and how your donation has helped beneficiaries in that charity. So again, uh, moving away from food, moving away from sitting around a table and eating and being uncomfortable. Now we, we just, um, maybe it's an opportunity to reinvent what donation is all about. We'll move on to another uh, question. Um, in, in this case, uh, maybe it's a, related to what you said, um, in that case, it's a fundraiser. But in this case, it's a, let's say it's a charity organization whose actually main goal is actually the performing arts, right? So it's a, it's a little different um, in a sense. It's not so much fundraiser, but it's actually their business. So for example, a performing group could be music, could be theater, you know, it, you know their, their main way of raising funds or actually doing business is actually through performances. So would your advice or approach be different given that they are mean that what they're doing here is, you know, besides a fundraising part, but it seems like a core part of their cause or their business? Yeah, you know, um, since this happened, we have a lot of freelance artists, um, yes. performing groups, and they've been coming to the Law Society Pro Bono Office under the Advocates for Arts scheme, seeking help. Because basically these artists, um, they are freelancers. They're kind of yes. part of the gig economy. So they, they live on this sort of um, freelance jobs every, every month or every year down the road. And they don't make a lot of money. 
So um, when this pandemic struck, so many shows were cancelled. So many um, performances were rescheduled. The, uh, the government tried to help, but they focused on helping organizations. And then a lot of individuals, not just performers, but people who work backstage and people who work lighting and sound, they, they, they found themselves um, jobless for a long time. So whenever I, I advise, I, I try and tell the charities to go easy on the performers that they, they hire, try and, try and do something uh, to help them because they, they are part of the victims of this. Now, um, I go back to contracts. So when when um, freelancers or artists sign on, uh, to perform, we have to look at the contracts. A lot of times, the performance is stated to be scheduled within a certain time window, and it can't be moved because if you move it, it will impact another performance down the road. Now, the problem is that if the performance doesn't go ahead, the theater company doesn't get to sell tickets and won't get revenue. So there's simply no money to pay the performance. Um, what what this means is that a lot of organizations have to get insurance. So insurance is the key for this type of situation. Um, and there, there are insurance uh, schemes available, especially for performance type organizations that in the event, uh, this whole year is a washout or this performance is a washout because of a war, a riot or a pandemic, then we get something back. We get some support. So um, I think now is a great time to rethink this idea of insurance. And, and um, this is for organizations. For individuals, I, I want artists to band together uh, to form an association and get out some common basic uh, terms and conditions that will protect them. But that, that's, that's kind of for the long term. Right now, they, they are all suffering. So please go easy on them. Don't forfeit all their money. Thank you, Adrian. I, I think that's such a, a useful uh, reminder in that, you know, it's not only, I think, charities, but I think everyone is facing uh, financial difficulties or the impact of COVID-19. So I suppose in terms of trying to come to some sort of commercial agreement to, I suppose, you know, trying to see where everyone's interest lies and to take it on board in terms of finding a solution. Yeah, so so I think um, if I can also quickly answer the earlier question that came up about how uh, you know a part, you know um, a tenant can actually inform the landlord, uh, especially if they are a charity organisation. I think um, the broad details. I think most landlords would accept it the minute that you you do alert in that form. But definitely, whatever uh, statements that you can add to it. Uh, usually there will be some form of audited accounts or accounts in general, you know, showing uh, what are the um, what is the amount that you're receiving uh, right now as compared to a, pre a certain period before. Uh, I think those, those are all very helpful um, evidence or statements that you could give uh, to your landlord. Uh, generally, you know, um, also, for example, if you're running, um, you know, it could be a, a daycare center or, or some form of uh, organization like that. Again, you know, uh, the, the difficult situation of the people, less participants attending certain talks that you're giving, uh, all, all these go uh, to, to an extent to show uh, the landlord, you know, that, that you are facing some kind of difficulty. Uh, and I think as long as you can show that initial case uh, that, that you are having this difficulty, you would be entitled to ask that from your landlord. Uh, and, and they should be quite amenable to giving uh, that, that period of um, rental delay uh, in a sense. Um, but again, you know, for the organizations, just to bear in mind that at the end of the day, we still need to kind of uh, adjust with times. Uh, apart from the job support scheme, I think that was mentioned earlier, uh, there's also, you know, uh, digital initiatives, uh, grants that are being given uh, to improve the workplaces, especially in this COVID period. Uh, there are traineeship uh, grants as well that are given, you know, if you need additional manpower. So, so I think really to, to take note of all these uh, different forms and, and make use of that, you know, to improve the business uh, or organization such that, you know, you are able to make those payments when the time comes. Yeah. 
Thanks, Renita. I think um, on this topic, there's another popular question from the audience. Uh, I think most people have heard that there is a property tax remission and possibly rental relief. Um, are you able to give any um, overview on that? Yeah, so I, I think a little bit of what I, I also mentioned earlier, I think for property tax, definitely uh, the, the landlords are expected to receive a certain amount of property tax rebate. Uh, and depending on the type of property, they, you know, they are in the midst, most of them uh, are in the midst of calculating that amount. Uh, and I think almost at least all the major landlords, there's a definite uh, commitment to pass that on to tenants. So uh, that is, you know, should be just a matter of time working out with your landlord what's the actual amount uh, that you might be entitled to. Uh, again, in terms of rental relief, now with the just very recent, uh, it was just at the start uh, of the month, you know, the, the recent uh, adjustments or, or amendments to the bill, uh, landlords are now also required to provide a certain amount of rental relief. Uh, so also to gain, you know, um, uh, tenants should be asking their landlords um, about if they're not already informed about how these uh, rental reliefs will come to them. So they generally waive, uh, they generally range between a period of two to four months, uh, half of which is borne by government and then half of which will be borne by the landlords. Uh, and there are major landlords that even before this rental relief have um, uh, informed tenants that there will be a certain amount of rental relief given. Uh, if not, it will always be good for tenants to try to initiate that discussion uh, again, it could be, you know, asking for whether a certain amount of a rebate uh, or delay in, in payment, um, as well as, you know, uh, again, could be downsizing of certain premises um, or uh, trying to work out other alternative models. Uh, I think in the rental space nowadays, you know, there are, there are a lot of um, uh, different type of technology that is coming on board. Uh, there's also co-working spaces, you know, so quite quite a number of different models that be explored um, for, for organizations to consider during this period of time or slowly as they go on uh, with their business costs. Yeah. Thanks, Renita. I think another related question to this is um, and a participant asked that, you know, their, their lease expires in, let's say, August. Um, so obviously, that's midway through the year. So does this mean that they can still get a pro prorated amount of uh, rental rebate? Or yes. are they, or they, they can't at all? They, they would get a, a prorated amount. Uh, I mean, they would they would get, uh, I mean, when you say prorated amount, again, I just caution, it's not a, a rental, uh, I mean, there are two parts. One is rent relief. So for the current months, you know, uh, from April to, to that period of August, the tenant is able to delay the rent that they need to pay. But in terms of the rental relief of the two to four months that they might be entitled to, yes, they would get a, a prorated amount of that. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Adrian and Renita. It was a really useful discussion. I'm sure um, the audience would agree with me as well. So we must bring our Q&A session to a close. Uh, before we leave, I think it is important to highlight that there are many avenues of assistance that you can tap on one of which is the Law Society Pro Bono Services. Law Society Pro Bono Services serves the community by linking charitable, non-profit and social enterprises in Singapore, which require legal assistance on corporate law matters with qualified lawyers. This ensures that these sectors are given the necessary support to enable, to, to need it to enable good work. If your charity is in need of legal assistance, you may email them at assistnpos at lawsocprobono.org. For more details on the Center for Nonprofit Leadership, please do not forget to download the handouts. With that, we hope that you found our webinar useful. A survey will be sent to you and we appreciate your feedback, which will be used to make future webinars more relevant and useful to you. Thank you again, Mr. So, Adrian and Renita for joining us today. And most of all, thank all of you for attending our webinar and have a great day ahead.